All right, welcome to the Jeff Hagee Show. Today, I want to introduce you to Max Brown. I'm excited to have Max here. Uh, he's got a really cool history. I'm really intrigued by the things that he's done and the things he's doing from his sports background to what he's currently doing in real estate and different things. So there, there's a lot to go through. It, it started out as, you know, Gatorade player of the year, football player, going on playing at USC, but I'm going to let you, Max, I, I'm not going to do it justification. So <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to you. Give us an introduction of who you are and what you're doing. Yeah, we originally crossed paths on TikTok, but before the TikTok uh, past decade or so, I've had a bunch of twists and turns in my life. I'm 28 now, but at uh, 17, 18, I was the Gatorade National High School Football Player of the Year in 2013. That's the class with uh, Derek Henry, Jared Goff, Baker Mayfield, a lot of those guys. I was supposed to be the, uh, the next guy on the NFL stage at some day. Uh, I went to USC. Um, I was a captain there, but, uh, spent the majority of my time as a backup there, did not find success, finished up at the university of Pittsburgh. Uh, my career there, uh, was halted after five games with an injury. So, um, had the, had the battles of a, of a collegiate athlete with, um, high expectations, which uh, was a lot to deal with at the time. Still tried to rehab and give professional football a run, had tryouts with a couple teams and went through that whole process, but ultimately uh, had to pivot away and figure out my new identity post football, which was difficult. I always say I, I was the type of guy that no, no one, no one liked football more than me. I was a 12 year old that could watch 12 hours of NFL network every single day. And that was that was my vision. That was my dream. That's um, that's what I worked uh, so hard to to accomplish. And in many many respects, I didn't get it done, and felt the um, have, have dealt with a lot of backlash from that. Just you know the reports and um, the as us as us sports fans know the the chatter that can come by way of that. But uh, anyways, after football, I, I went into the social media world. I worked for two popular personal branding names, one in Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V, and the other in Lewis Howes, um, which was a great experience. Ultimately, just didn't love the industry at large, decided to pivot away, still use my learnings on TikTok and Instagram. So it never, never goes away. But currently, I'm a uh, college football analyst. I'm a color commentator for the Pac-12 Network, calling games in the booth there on Saturdays. I uh, work for SiriusXM as well, doing some radio stuff. And then also uh, a full-time commercial real estate broker here uh, on the West Coast. So got a couple irons in the fire and uh, it's been been uh, a exciting journey the past decade or so. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to have more of a conversation about this because the, the TikTok that first grabbed my attention um, because we run the Confident Athlete Program and you... The, when I came across it, it was a TikTok about, you know, introducing yourself as a former five-star quarterback that didn't make it. That's how, it, I mean, that that's a pretty good hook, you know, <laughs> so that grabbed my attention right away. But then you got talking about the importance of investing in a sports psychologist or a mental coach um, earlier rather than later. And you went into a few of the reasons why. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. Do you want to talk about why you think that needs to happen for athletes? Certainly. Yeah, that video. Um, and I'll just kind of give the synopsis of what I was saying on that video is, you know, investing in a mental coach is, is great for two reasons. The first is well documented. And I think the sports world's come a long way in the past, call it five to seven years. And that's just, hey, lay the foundation for 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 success, right? Lay the foundation for tools and tactics for for bettering yourself. Um, which is, I wouldn't say fairly obvious, but much more mainstream nowadays than maybe where it was when I played a decade ago. But the big, the second reason, I think this is a big one. Um, and as a five-star guy myself with tons of expectations, my, I was arguing that, Hey, if I, if I was a parent, I wouldn't invest in that mental coach long before you need it. If you know your kids on a path towards athletic success, even academic success, musical success, art success, whatever it is, you know that they have a, they are choosing a path that they are going to deal with public scrutiny. They are going to deal with expectations. They're going to deal with all of those emotions that come. Invest in it early because here's what happens. And I've seen it 
I, I've seen it every single time. I actually have not seen it the other way around. Um, every athlete that I play with in college, they choose to see a sports psychologist once it hits the fan in their career, as I say, right? They're, they're benched. They got hurt. They're not playing the way they want to. The coach isn't on their side. Whatever the reason is, scrutiny, whatever it is, that's the point that they say, all right, I need to see a prof uh, professional, which is great. That's very, much, much better than the alternative. But what happens there is within that inner circle, within their family, friends, parents especially, it becomes a whole thing that, oh, Max is struggling. So Max had to see a mental performance specialist, coach, whatever it might be. And because it becomes a thing in my personal experience and what I've observed from others, it can lead to more anxiety, more pressure, and more overthinking, overanalyzing as a result of it being a thing versus if I, in my scenario, said, all right, Max, I know I'm on a path to you know, being a big-time quarterback. Let me invest in a sports psychologist my sophomore year in high school, just like I did a private quarterback coach. Then when, hey, you know it's going to happen at some point. For me, it happened my freshman year of college that where I said, all right, I need to see. I need to seek some help. I'm not playing the way I want to. Then at that point, if I had started earlier, this is just part of my process, just like a coach, just like a weightlifting coach. And it wouldn't have become such a thing um, for me, just personally inside. It was. Uh, it led to, I think, a lot of uh, or more anxiety and overthinking than uh, than than it may have uh, needed to needed to have. Athletes put a lot of time, money, and effort into the physical aspect of their sport, but they often neglect the mental game. And the mental game, it's just as important as the physical. In fact, it's often the differentiating factor between good and great athletes. If you really want to reach your full potential, if you want to be a great athlete, you've got to pay attention to the mental game. Now, come and join us in the Confident Athlete Program, where you're going to learn how to develop a powerful mindset, extreme self-confidence, and really take your game to the next level. Come and check us out at confidentathleteprogram.com slash membership. Yeah, that and that what you said there, just like a weightlifting coach, just like a whatever coach, that that's really one of the things we focus on is we say, you know, you put so much time, money, and effort into the physical aspect of your sport, but the mental game is just as important, but it's often the part that's neglected. But it's also what can really keep you going, can advance you what you're going to do. Or it's going to separate you from someone that's equally talented, but you've got that mental edge. So, and yeah. I'm sure you saw it at a lot at your level too. And it's such a fine line because I would like to think in high school, I was as confident of a kid as they come, self-assured. I, I would like to think I was not cocky, but very, you know, um, I, I felt like this, this was my mission and I think at that time, a lot of kids, they don't want to see the mental coach because they don't even want to entertain the fact that things could ever go wrong. And parents and coaches, they don't ever want to put that bad mojo in them in any regard. But I think the people that have been down that path, and I'm hopeful that people listen to my story and say, you know what? Hey, maybe my son or daughter is a little bit like Max when he was a sophomore in college. I'm telling you this right now. It's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time before, even if you're LeBron James, Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, and your career is going to be one for the ages, even those guys need the mental help. So it's only a matter of time. I would say get out of the connotation that you're, you're too good for it or I don't want that bad mojo. It doesn't even need to be looked at that way. It's, it's, it, it, it can certainly be looked at through a context of I'm just trying to level up my game just like I would my throwing motion or my body, just like you were saying. Right. No. And then obviously you can see um, some of the downside of not having one soon enough, but was that something that really helped you at that time though? It did. It did. Um, just to be candid for me, I, I don't think it was like groundbreaking per se. Um, I think you do hear of um, guys and girls where it does, you know, change the entire trajectory of their career. I, I don't know if I'm necessarily in that bucket, but the biggest advantage of seeing a professional for me at that time was I felt like no one could relate to me. Right. I, I was a five star quarterback. I wasn't having success early. Um, when I talk to my friends and family, right, they don't ever, like I was just saying, they don't ever want to 
put bad mojo on my career. It's always, oh, Max, you're fine. Just trust the process. And, and they come at it through a lens of love, but they come at it through, hey, they, they've known me since I was a little kid. And then coaches, they come at it through a different lens, right? They got tons of players to manage and all that. And so by seeing a professional for me, it was refreshing talking to a third party that had nothing to do with my sports career, nothing to do with my life and could give me a fresh perspective and relate to me with the here and now, not Max Brown, the 12 year old, not Max Brown, the superstar 17 year old, but Max Brown, the 19 year old who's pissed off. He's not playing well. Who's pissed off that he's, you know, the work isn't paying off at that time. Help me through these. And so I, I think at that point, just from a conversational point to get a lot of things off my chest and work on tactics and tools and whatnot was extremely beneficial working with a third party that, uh, didn't have a stake in my life. And actually, the most important part with that is for a lot of people, their inner circles telling them they're the best thing, you know, since whatever. And they need that third party to be a, to be realist with them, right? It's not the coach is always screwing you or it's not that they just can't see the talent in you. No, sometimes you do have some things you need to work through and see and talking with someone that doesn't have a stake in your prior you know, path and growing up and history and whatnot, I think is extremely beneficial. You know, one of the things as you're talking about that, obviously one of the keys to building your own confidence is preparation. You had done that. You had put in the work. You had done everything you needed to on the physical side of things. and And it wasn't turning out how you wanted it to. So what were some of the things that you did to continue building your mental game when that was happening a lot of what you hear is about focus on the process uh, that's certainly the case that you know that that's what i embarked on but to to dive a little deeper at that stage in my career um uh, my coach at the time would always say something like hey max the light's gonna turn on max just wait the light's gonna turn on any day just wait and i didn't realized that that mentality was actually hurting me at that time. And it took a sports psychologist to um, help me through that because here's what what would happen for two straight years. I would show up early. I'd stay late. I'd throw the extra routes and I would say, you know what? Today is going to be the day that the light turns on. Today is the day the light turns on. But the reality is that's not really realistic to go from playing poorly to then light turns on. And then now I am a, you know, Pac-12 starting caliber quarterback, or even at that point, I was thinking, hey, I was going to be an All-American level quarterback, right? It's just a matter of, matter of time before the light turns on, and I'm an All-American. Well, there's a ton of steps between not playing well and All-American, and I think to recalibrate myself to find success in the little things, right? This day of practice, I'm focusing on this one route and this one motion, And I'm going to find success in just fine tuning that. It's not going to be, hey, Max, can you go 20 for 20 in the scrimmage periods and be Mr. High and Mighty Heisman Trophy winner? No, focus on the individual period and find success in the little things, the minute things, and allow yourself to um, feel a sense of accomplishment from working on one little thing every day. Rather than for me at that time, I was trying to accomplish everything in one swoop, thinking that everything was going to be solved in one practice and recalibrating that mentality in my mind, I think grounded me. Um, and it allowed me just to be more like happy and, 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 uh, and, and trust the work that I was doing more than at the time it was, man, should I be changing this motion or should I be doing this exercise or should I be eating this or should I be waking up and doing this therapy motion? And it was overwhelming because I was wanting to do whatever it took to find success. And uh, I think stripping it down a little bit and focusing on just day by day was uh, what I needed at that point in my career. You know, one of the things you said there was it allowed you to be happy. And that's one thing, especially when athletes first start working with us, some of the things I often will ask them is, you know, why did you start playing your sport to begin with? Because obviously when they started, they weren't that good. And who are you playing for? Because I see so many, you know, they get up to AAU or whatever, and they're a great player, but they're doing everything for a parent or a coach or something. And they're not even having fun doing it anymore. So how important that is, is it for an athlete to play at their, at their best to, 
have that happiness, to have that mentality of, you know, this is fun. I think that's, that's crucial. And it's funny. I'll, I'll talk with some of my buddies now at USC. Um, I don't mean to burst any motivational coaches bubble, but I'll say this. Some of my most successful teammates ever were not the hardest workers. They were the guys that had the most fun. They were the guys that walked out there and at times were, um, Felt like they were careless. I've played with Super Bowl champions uh, at USC. They weren't the hardest workers. No, no disrespect, but they were guys that showed up and they had a blast every day. And they were guys that when it was time to walk off the field, they had the ability to turn the off switch. And it wasn't that they were lazy. It wasn't that they, um, you know, weren't weren't getting it done. But I think so often we hear, you know, like the Mamba mentality, R.I.P. Kobe. But you hear that's kind of ingrained in athletes' minds. Well, I'm here to tell you, I've had a lot of successful teammates that were not wired that way. And I think the message there is you got to be true to yourself. If you're a grinder, be a grinder. If you're a guy that's just fun-loving and this is a sport, be fun-loving and this is a sport. Still take care of your business, but there's thresholds to that. I'm not saying, hey, you know, just be a, 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 a slappy and play video games all day, but be true to who you are. I think to, to your point a little bit there, the guys that get really worn down are the guys that are doing it for the wrong reasons, right? They're showing up for for their parent and, and, and all that. And that's just a recipe inevitably for for, uh, for, for, for for tough times. And I think there's also an element of there of, you know, the self-awareness as, as well as, hey, when, when do I need help, right? Am I a guy that, you know, needs to invest in X, Y? It doesn't always have to be a mental, mental coach, but um, cer certain things, everyone's past different. Everyone's mentality is different. I think it's important to be uh, just true to yourself there. Let's talk a little bit about, I want to talk about high school athletes for a minute. And I like your perspective, not only because you've been through it, but being a commentator and stuff, you're still in the mix of everything. And I've heard a lot of the things you talk about that I think are very important for athletes to hear. And one thing that I was just thinking about was, you know, you, you were player of the year, you were the best out there. Well, there's a lot of players out there in all sports that they're the absolutely standout best of the best in their team. They're not a div one player. They're great, but they've got that mentality is I'm the best. I'm div one or nothing. Talk, talk a little bit about that whole process of, you know, the difference between div one, two, three, those type of options and realizing, because I've, I've worked with players that all of a sudden they get to a div one school and they're like, okay, th this is kind of a different level. This is like a job now. This isn't playing anymore. There's a big difference there. So do you want to just touch on that a bit? Of course, yeah. And for context, I went to a uh, a really strong public high school outside of Seattle um, that we won, we won state championships. And I say that because I, I had teammates that were, you know, scratching and clawing to be D3. And that was a successful path for them all the way up to guys like myself and everywhere in between division one walk-ons, right? D1 double A guys. And I think um, I'll, I'll speak to it in the lens of I had teammates that, you know, I think were so focused on getting to D1 and whatever it took there that in hindsight, and I think they probably would tell you this now at 28, that they may have missed out on some of the true fun experiences of high school and that process as a result of worrying so much about D1. And as I say that, I'm sure listeners might be saying, well, Max, it's easier for you to say you had all the offers. And, and I, I, I hear that. But then, but just, I guess, almost trust me that I've seen guys that, you know, you're, you're, you're putting so much pressure on yourself to get that Division One offer that you're frustrated with yourself when it's all done, when the music totally stops, that you didn't take advantage of that high school opportunity that you had. But yeah, to answer your question a little bit more directly, I think you know the the, the division three level. There's a lot of successful football players there, and, and in my experience, the guys that have most success at that level are ones that truly love the game. Right? They they can't envision their college days without it. And if you're not that guy. You might still find path there, but I've also had guys say, you know what, in hindsight, I'm glad I didn't go down that route because I didn't love the game enough to scratch and claw at that D3, D2 level. The D1 AA level, 
Um, again, there's a lot of great players there and a lot of guys that, you know, probably could play D1. But in hindsight, they're glad they ended up at a D1 AA program because then they're the stud on their team. They're having a great time. They're playing. It's not like you're getting lost in the shuffle on a D1 team. So every, I think every, le- every level has its, its trade-offs there. Um, obviously, there's advantages to the Division One level just from a financial standpoint. But uh, there's a place for everyone if you want to play ball and you're, and you're willing to grind and make it happen. Yeah, and I, I think that's where for a lot of guys, and you've seen a lot of guys with the success taking this route that – they say, you know, I no, I'd never go JUCO, but taking that first step in the JUCO and then going up has been a great move for them. Totally. And I think, again, that just comes down to a lot of, you know, self-awareness of are you a guy that can truly, like, do you genuinely feel like you're, you can play at that D1 level or is it just other people telling you and you're in the back of your mind, you're like, you know what, I kind of want to just go to school and go that route, which is great. And I've had several friends be so thankful they did do that. They went to a big division school or a big school and um, chose that path. I've also had guys that say, you know what, I was a guy that was late to develop in high school. I got injured maybe there. I I owe it to myself to give myself that one shot. I'm going to go the JC route and see what happens. And they found success as well. So all sorts of different paths. and, 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 and tons of options out there for sure. Um, something I want to talk about because I don't know a lot about it, but I've heard you talk about it and I want to know your thoughts on it and how you think it's impacting sport and what you see in the future of it. But let's talk about NIL. NIL, where to start? You want just <laughs> big, big picture, big picture thoughts on it all? Yeah. I am a proponent of NIL. I think um, I speak through the lens of a guy who my market value. I guess, I guess before we get in too deep, explain what it is first, just assuming everyone knows, but just in case, just explain that too. NIL name, image, and likeness. Um, It allows student athletes in this context to get monetary value to get paid um, as a result of their name, image, and likeness. So basically their personal brand. For those that haven't been in, totally in the weeds, that you could not do that as recently as what, three or four years ago, three years ago, two years ago. Um, uh, for context, if in my situation, I'm 28, but I, I wasn't able to capitalize on this. I was not allowed to run a Max Brown football camp and and gain uh, and, and get paid for that. I was not uh, when USC sold a number four jersey. I was not able to get paid for that in any regard. When I was in the NCAA football video game as number four freshman, six five, two twenty guy, two twenty two hundred twenty pound guy from Sammamish, Washington, I did not get a single cent for that. Nowadays, you can do that and you can leverage that platform. If you hence my tone there, I am a proponent of NIL. I think um, I was a guy, you know, I missed out on millions of dollars straight up. And um, I'm happy that guys can get their their market value for that. The market value being there are coaches that are getting paid millions of dollars to get recruits, five star recruits into their school for the betterment of the university, for betterment of the program, to bring in money for the university at large. There should be a certain value to that. I'm a proponent of that. I think there's two big buckets that are going on right now. There's the collective side, which you'll hear about, which is largely boosters coming together, pooling money to you know, pay athletes in some capacity um, to support them financially, to lure athletes to their program. And then the other bucket is more of the branding side i call it like the the brand deal side more like what you see with influencers where they're um teaming up with a company and teaming up with a brand and having an instagram post i think that side is extremely healthy i think that side you're going to see more and more of that what is going to have to play out a little bit is more of the collective side the first bucket that i talked about in that Right now, it's the wild, wild west. There's very little rules and regulations. Um, I think it's only a matter of time before boosters buy them, buy their way to a championship. 
a school that is not a blue blood program right now that is able to pull boosters, get five star recruits and literally pay for play in many respects and, and find their way to a championship. I think it's only a matter of time before that happens. And uh, that's going to be all the talk over the next five to 10 years as that process sorts out and the market kind of right now it's fresh. The market hasn't figured it figured itself out. Um, and it will in the coming years in terms of what is the appropriate market value for, for each player. Right. And I mean, I, I'm uneducated on the whole system, but that's kind of how I've looked at it is yeah, there's going to be, um, organizations buying their way to a championship, but there obviously are still, there's something there because I mean, we look at the twins down in Miami. Do you know the details around what's got that all brought up? Not the specifics. I'm aware of who they are, but not the specifics. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I know it was something to do with a booster in NIL and it caused some issues, but it, yeah, I didn't know how that was going to play out. Um, now, continuing on that and either continuing on it or as a separate thing altogether, um, let's talk about I mean, we're mostly just focused on football here, but let's talk about the transfer portal and how that's changed things over the last little bit as well. In particular, if you want to hit on Colorado, go ahead there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the buffs doing work in the portal. Yeah, the portal has been, it really has changed the game. Um, and it's funny, and I think some people lose track of this. Like before the portal, the portal existed in a similar way, the rules were different, but the idea that you could throw your name into at the time when I did it in 2017, it was an online database. It didn't have the trendy term of the portal, but an online database. And then every academic school got an email that said, Hey, Max Brown um, has been released from USC. He's seeking X, Y, Z, that type of thing. I say that because I think the biggest switch, especially in a football context, is the connotation around transferring. When I was in college or when I walked into college, I would I, I would say largely the connotation was if you transferred, that meant you failed, you didn't work out, um, there, there was something wrong with you and that's why you were transferring. And so as a result, guys, I think were very hesitant to transfer and you, you kind of had a sour, a, a sour label on yourself if you were a transfer guy, like, oh, well, what'd you do at your last school type of thing versus nowadays, that could be that, that couldn't be further from the truth. It's 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 part of just player movement. It's basically free agency, like we see in uh, in professional sports. And again, I think it's good for the player in large part because we have seen for the better side of the last decade coaches jumping from school to school, what seems like yearly chasing the next paycheck, chasing the next promotion. Yet when they're in the living room of a recruit, they're saying, "Hey, I'm going to be with you for four years and all that." And I can't blame the coaches for moving. I probably would do the same thing if I was down the coaching route. But it's not fair when players are going to a school trying to play for that guy and then they're locked in. So I think it's healthy for the player. I think um, it allows more opportunity for them. But it also – I'm not naive to the realities of it makes it really difficult for schools that um, – aren't blue blood programs and are maybe, maybe, you know, bottom half of um, athletic standing type of programs, especially the division one level, because they're basically, it, it, we're heading down a path where maybe they're a farm system for bigger schools just to pluck themselves away. So it's a delicate, it's a delicate process, but I think it's just part of our game and our sport evolving and those that embrace it and are cutting edge with it will win and those that continue to fight with it will lose, and that will play out in the uh, in the coming decade. All right, thanks for that. No, I I love hearing people talk about it and just getting the different perspectives. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, my nephew uh, at Arizona because he transferred from Southern Utah, and so getting I know his story, but I don't know how the whole thing works. So it's been interesting. That, that's a perfect example. Yeah. For, uh, for context, I've called a couple of, uh, of Jeff's uh, nephew's games and he's a perfect example of, you know, transfers to Arizona. He's a featured guy. His career gets resurrected in some, in some regard and has probably the most opportunity that he's had in, in, in a while. And he's, he's reaping the, uh, reaping the benefits of it. So in that scenario, like it's perfect 10 years yeah. ago, maybe he doesn't get that opportunity. 
Yeah, right. Exactly. All right. I, I want to go, I want to talk to you a little bit more about after football, but just before we head there, just if, if you could give a message to any high school athlete right now that really wants to maximize their potential, maximize their career, what would you give them? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it's going to sound basic, but I would say, you know, it, like if you're really serious about this thing in, invest in it, invest in it to, to, uh, to what we said earlier, like both mentally, physically. I think when I look back and the, the guys that had the best opportunities, it's, it's guys that took it serious early on and the guys that got burned and some of the, the, my peers that had probably the most frustration, most frustration with the process is they woke up as, you know, a second semester junior in high school and said, I want to get an opportunity. And at that point, like it's an uphill battle. It, it, it's, it, it's fairly late. So I would say, you know, if you're serious about this thing, you got to commit to it full force. Um, but I also would couple that with hat, like, don't, don't waste that opportunity. High school sports is so precious that enjoy that process along the way. You can have both. It's not, Hey, I'm going to be super intense and then I can't have fun. No, you can be intense. And with that hard work, with that investment, can allow you to show up in your high school season saying, Hey, I've put my best foot forward. And in my, in, in my life, that's, that's what's given me a lot of peace as well. My college career didn't work out, but I can look at myself and say, you know what? It wasn't because I didn't work, work, work hard. It wasn't because I didn't invest in that. And that allows me to have peace moving forward in the next phase of life versus if you aren't that, and you're a guy that says, man, I wish I would have done this and that, and I wish I would have made this call, and I wish I would have sought this out and all that, that's where I think it eats eats uh, eats at people. So if you're serious about it, invest it and, uh, and uh, go all in on it. Awesome. Thank you. Now, one of the things I talk a lot with our athletes about is, you know, the things that we teach them, whether it's on confidence, uh, mental toughness, all those things. We're focused on their sport, obviously, but it's it's things that they're going to take throughout the rest of their lives. You know, a lot of the things that I value most are things that I learned from my coaches. And so just talk a little bit about, I mean, you've got a cool journey from sports to Lewis Howes, Gary V, commercial real estate. So just talk a little bit about how that all has tied together and what those opportunities have looked like. You're spot on. The lessons from sport don't don't uh, don't just evaporate, and that's that's a message I try to champion because I have a lot of teammates that you know when their football days are done, they you know they're hard workers. They were guys that were grinding in the weight room and whatnot, and um, that I mean you can you can transfer that over into the professional life as well, and even your personal life with how you show up for relationships and, and things of that nature. But on the most basic level, I mean. When you're waking up, when you're a college athlete and you're waking up at 6 a.m. having to do winter conditioning and getting yelled at by a strength coach and cussed out by a strength coach, like I can promise you, the corporate world is not like that. The business world is not like that in a good way. Because if that's what you're used to and you show up to an office, it's in, you know, you got to be in at 8 a.m. 8 a.m., you know, that's that's early for a lot of a lot of um, offices around the country. But if, but but if you're used to, you know, show up, showing up even earlier than that, like that, that, that's a mentality that can can serve you well um, in 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 multiple facets of uh, of the professional life. So I would say keep that mentality. Um, and I know it's served me well, especially as I've you know transferred into the professional side of things. Very cool. So <clears throat> the people that are listening to this and want to stay connected with you and learn more about you, where can they find you? Yeah, I'm active on social, uh, TikTok, Brown Max. My last name is an E, uh, on, an e on it, excuse me. Instagram's Max Brown, uh, active on LinkedIn as well. Can uh, hit me up there. That's obviously more of the, uh, I would say real estate, real estate stuff. And then uh, Twitter a little bit as well. Max Brown four there. So I'm active on the socials and I feel like every platform is a different, uh, different theme. Twitter's much, much more uh, football. So wherever, whatever floats your boat, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm there. Awesome. And I'll put all those links in the show notes too. So you can go find them there, but Max, thank you. Appreciate uh, you sharing your story and your wisdom with us. And just thanks for being here. 
Thanks for having me, Jeff. This was, uh, this was fun. Who you surround yourself with really does matter. The people you associate with and spend time with have a huge impact on who you become and what you do in your life. Hi, my name is Jeff Hagee, and I want to tell you about my Inner Circle Mastermind Group. This is a group that's designed to surround you with like-minded, high achievers who will help you to think bigger and amplify the performance of your business and your life while tearing down all the barriers that are holding you back. A mastermind is the fastest way to get you to the next level. If you're ready to network and connect with other successful entrepreneurs and influencers, go to coachhagee.com mastermind.